pickleball too for those that are interested. Um, the weather for this week looks a little bit iffy, so uh, the way to know if that's going to happen or not is actually to check the Facebook page. There's a Fit to Serve Facebook page. Uh, we'll attempt to share that through our other streams as well. Um, but we'll make that call probably Tuesday, I would guess, Tuesday evening and uh, let you guys know what's going on there for that. But we'd love to have you join us for that. Fellowship is a big deal to us, uh, and so it's a great way to get to know folks, to get in your walking as well, and uh, we pray that you will certainly do that. I know that uh, Ashley and I and the girls have been walking the last couple days and enjoying that time together. It's a good time of year to get back outside and um, kind of thaw out a little bit. So uh, we pray that, uh, that you will take advantage of that. Also in the way of announcements for the coming week, uh, next Sunday is Daylight Savings Time, so don't forget that. Uh, we spring forward, which means we lose an hour of sleep, but we gain an hour of sunlight from now until whenever, uh, for those of you that don't wake up in the, in the middle of the night. So uh, anyways, hopefully you enjoy that. I used to say, like, set your clocks, but I don't really know how many clocks there are to set anymore. But if you have clocks to set, make sure you set them, okay? Um, otherwise, use your cell phone or whatever, and they'll set it for you, which is great, okay? So keep note of that. Also, next Sunday, March 10th, we will be having baptisms here, okay? We tell you that to say this. If there's some of you here today that say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking about it. I really would like to be baptized. We need to know that. We would love to, to chat with you. Um, it's important to us, to, to Pastor Robert and I, that we chat with you before, talk about the gospel, make sure that, that we understand the meaning of baptism, so that needs to, to kind of begin to unfold if next Sunday is your day. Um, so before you leave here today, if you're interested in being baptized, if you would come see either myself, Pastor Robert, or Audrey as well, I'm sure could take that note. Um, we'd love to know that. We can make contact with you this week and try to, try to see if that would work out. Um, but next Sunday morning, we have at least one uh, that's scheduled to be baptized. We'd love to have more uh, if the Lord is, le Lord is leading in that direction. Okay, uh, a couple things as it relates to student ministry, and then we'll pray and uh, and be uh, begin our worship together. First thing, high school students, uh, Wednesday night is our week to cook. I'm sure that Brother Daniel told you, um, but I'm sure many of you did not tell your parents. Okay, so parents of high school students, uh, we cook this Wednesday, which means uh, we will start up about 4:30. We could use some students to help us just prep things and also serve. Uh, as, it, as it relates to that. Also, in addition to that, high school parents, if five or six of you would be willing to help set up the sanctuary after we're done, that would be huge. The benefit to that is, is that we can actually do Bible study with your students instead of being in here working to get things back right. So if a few parents are willing to help clean up in the kitchen and also set back up out here, that would be fantastic. And then finally, all youth parents, uh, two weeks from today, we are going bowling with the students. Uh, if your student is interested in coming to that, so that's middle and high school, we need them to sign up by next Sunday. All right, so we need to be able to tell the bowling now how many is coming. So the way to do that is simple. There's flyers all over the church with a QR code. Scan that. You can sign up online. It's the easiest thing to do. If you have any questions about that, you can certainly come and chat with us. But next Sunday will be the deadline for that. And, uh, and so we don't want you to miss it, all right? So just make note of that. And I know I said that was the last announcement, but there's one more. I'm a preacher. I'm allowed to do this. Um, the last one is both, uh, Discover, Discover Smyrna, both of our Smyrna U classes tonight are on a schedule, okay? So Pastor Robert um, was not here last Sunday. He'll be back this Sunday. So if you're in his class, we'll be meeting at normal time. Also, if you're in my class, uh, we're going to meet as well. So everything is back to normal there. I know some of you had asked that question. So we want to make sure you know, okay? That being said, a lot more in the bulletin. Please pick it up. Remember our resource of the week. It's a good one. It's an article this week. Excellent. Uh, points to ponder. All kinds of stuff that we hope that you guys will avail yourself to. And, uh, but we didn't come for that. We came to worship. So let's start that in prayer, all right? Father, we are grateful for this day. We praise you for the beauty of it, for the joy of our gathering together as saints to, uh, Lord, just to exalt you. And so, Father, we pray to, today that we would exalt you well, that we would worship you in spirit and truth, uh, that you would lead and guide us through your spirit to illuminate truth, to see uh, what it is that we should know and to respond accordingly. God, I pray for our music uh, musicians behind us that are leading us in worship, that you would guide them. I pray for Pastor Robert. Be with him today, both vocally as he uh, stands to preach your word, and also, uh, Father, with clarity of thought, such that he can express to us what you have revealed to him this week. 
Uh, Lord, we've gathered in expectation. We trust that you will meet us here. Uh, we know that your word is inspired, that it's inerrant, that it's infallible. We trust that as it's read and explained to us that we will see more of Christ. And we pray that in so doing, that we would be conformed more to your image, that we would be equipped further to make much of you, and that we would be encouraged to go out into the world to build your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, Pastor Robert has asked me to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Huckey. I call you that because my boy uh, 
That's what he calls you. And so I appreciate you. You jumped right in, man. That's a lot of verses to read. That's awesome. But I uh, appreciate you and the relationships you're making, even with the young ones as you serve uh, in Awana. I know it's making a difference in uh, our life. So let's pray together uh, as we continue to worship. Lord, we just thank you for this time together, for your goodness uh, to us, for your word, that we can uh, sing together, that we can pray, that we can uh, hear preach to us. So we ask that you would bless this time now as we open uh, this word, that you, your spirit would move amongst your people, change us from the inside out to be more like Christ each and every day. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Huckey. Thank you, Brad. Uh, music ministry teams, we appreciate you. Um, my voice is not 100% yet, but uh, it's better than it was. So we're going to give this thing a shot this morning. I've got cough drops and water, and, uh, and we'll determine uh, if that's going to get us through. Uh, I, I was, Pastor Aaron was so... Uh, ready uh, to preach, and I'm so grateful for him and and um, his partnership in this ministry with me. Um, and so it's so comforting to know that uh, in the uh, in a pinch, uh, he he would be more than ready to to get the job done. Um, but I told him the other day, I said I really want to preach, and so uh, we're going to give it a shot and see how how chapter nine. Of the book of Genesis goes so I invite you to turn there with me uh, Mrs. Duke has already told me to stay calm and don't get overly excited and I told her no problem and she looked at me kind of funny like she didn't believe that was uh, likely but I'm gonna attempt to stay uh, reserved and, and I told her I said I think this sermon lends itself to that um, so we'll see how it goes all right um, so for those of you who are used to me being a little bit more um, uh, lively I'm going to try intentionally not to be so much so as to keep this uh, this voice going to the end of today's message uh, but thank you all for for your prayers and thoughts um, uh, Brother Chris Jones has covered for me the last couple Wednesday nights uh, as we've attempted to give this uh, this voice a break. And uh, so I appreciate him and the great job that he's been doing for us um, in, in that role. Um, so we're in Genesis chapter 9, and I'm going to just get right to it and uh, attempt <laughs> to say whatever words I can. Um, Pastor Aaron mentioned a moment ago that... Uh, uh, my class will be meeting tonight, and we are one way or the other. And so if after this um, it crashes, we're, we're, we're making arrangements for this evening. So uh, class, we do want you to meet, but it'll be determined later if I'll be actually teaching the class or not. But you come on because we've got a, a plan B uh, just in case, okay? Um, and I wanted to say one more thing. Brother Bobby Aldridge, just a moment ago, he I was sitting there, and he leaned up, and he tapped me, he said, uh, how's your brother doing? You know, that's where we were last week, my sister and I, and, and my other two brothers went down to Mississippi to see our third brother, who's terminally ill with cancer, and they've given him some months, and, uh, but he's doing really well, and he uh, goes to MD Anderson Cancer Center on Tuesday, which we're excited about that. He's still terminal, but maybe they can do something, and so... Um, so we'll see about that. But more important even than Bobby asking me how Timmy was doing, he said, is he saved? Does he know the Lord? And I said, yeah, I believe he does. Uh, and so that matters more than whether he lives or dies. What matters is does he know Jesus? Thank you, Brother Bobby. That's true for all of us, by the way. Uh, so I hope that you'll leave no doubt uh, in your life that as you live that nobody has to wonder that it will be crystal clear that you know Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. All right, gang, I'm going to jump right in. Now, after one more thing, 
it's in our blood, isn't it, Pastor? Um, I meant to grab Cheryl and Joe to ask if you would read for me, but since I didn't, and she's already holding a grandchild, uh, I'm, you want to come read? Thank you, Cheryl. I'm just trying to do everything I can to get to the end of this thing. So Miss Cheryl's going to read, uh, would you mind just reading the whole chapter? Or she's going to read chapter 9, it's 28 verses, uh, and I'm going to sit down and then I'll preach when you're done. Thank you, Cheryl. You want to grab that mic? Okay, Genesis chapter 9 in the English Standard Version. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. In chapter 8 of verse 20, uh, Genesis, Noah offers a burnt offering. Uh, and a burnt offering, by the way, is one that was offered for the atonement of sin. And so, as soon as they're off the boat, uh, Noah, although saved through the flood, uh, labeled as a righteous man, uh, we also understood, and he understood, he was a sinner. And so the need for atonement, the need for sacrifice was, was still there. And so Noah offers this sacrifice to the Lord, recognizing his need for that and his desire to sacrifice and to worship God. Um, 
he knew that need, there needed to be a substitution, a substitutionary sacrifice for the penalty of his sin. And I say that only to say, Pastor Aaron and I will be, as we've attempted to, building the, the case, if you will, or pointing to the reality that the scarlet thread of redemption runs throughout the Bible. And so already we see once again uh, man's recognition, Noah's recognition of sin and a need to be, for that sin to be paid for. And so that takes place in that, 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 uh, that, sacrificial, uh, uh, that sacrifice made on the altar as soon as they get off the boat. Uh, now what you're going to see, I'm, I'm going to just make a few statements and then I'll, I'll make two points today and uh, see if we can keep this thing relatively uh, short. Uh, you see a lot of grace extended uh, to this family uh, because you see they were sinners themselves. And again, I want you to know I'm starting off just with some, some basic statements, some thoughts. And, and then I, I hope it will work into what I believe is the most important aspects of this chapter. You see, because what we're doing in preaching through the book of Genesis in this way is trying to capture what is the main theme, what is the major focus of each chapter. We can't take the time to break down every verse and everything that you might want to hit in every chapter. So we're trying to get the over, overarching uh, theme or message or points of the chapter. And that's what I hope to do today. Uh, so there's a lot of grace extended uh, to this family who, as I say, were sinners themselves. Uh, it was extended in part to Noah and his family because of Noah's righteousness. You know, the Bible, the Bible describes him as a righteous man. And this was demonstrated in his obedience to God, expressed by his faithfulness to God's word. You see, why would God call him righteous? We know that he was a sinner. We're going to see that before we get out of chapter 9. But, but he was obedient. He was faithful. Uh, that was expressed in, in action. That was expressed in faithfulness to all that God commanded him to do. And I was reminded of the statement made in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, in reference to Abraham. Abraham believed God, and, and, and it, was, it was counted as righteousness. He was saved because he believed God. The same thing is true in Noah's life. He was considered righteous not because he was perfect, not because he was sinless, but because he trusted, he believed God. He took God at his word and he lived as it was authoritative and as if it were true. And that's exemplified in his obedience over and over and over. Noah and his family escaped judgment because of God's grace extended to Noah due to his belief. All right, so we move on from that. More than that, though, it is the fact that God is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God who would never renege on his commission first given to Adam and Eve and now restated to Noah and his family. Now, we'll look at that a little bit closer in just a moment. Now, friends, I'm, I'm saying this up front because it's important for us to realize that God's word... His word, listen, really should be the basis for our confidence and hope. You know, again, when I think about the world that we're living in now, and, and there, there are reasons to be discouraged, there are reasons to be concerned. But, but I would say this to you, even as I, uh, parenthetically, just because things may look a little off the rails now, and our tendency, my dad and I were talking about this yesterday. The tendency is for us to believe right off the bat that the end must be near. You hear it all the time. I'm not so quick to jump there. In part because what you don't always factor in is how many times this cycle has repeated itself in history. Do you realize how many times uh, the populace has, has been at a place where they thought this has got to be the end. It's lining up with scripture. Only to see God, by grace and mercy, extend more time. To bring a, a deliverer. 
to bring a revival, to bring some type of renewal. So, beloved, I'm not saying the end is not here. I'm not saying it isn't coming. Ultimately, it's going to come. You'll win. And rather than worrying about, is it going to be tomorrow, am I ready? Yes. But I'm going to live like it's 10,000 years from now. Because there's plenty of work to be done. And a lot of reason for us to hope that we've, our, our best days aren't finished. I don't believe that our last hope is Donald Trump. I believe our, our only hope is Jesus Christ. By the way, that's not a, I'm not trying to bash Donald Trump. I'm just trying to bash that idea. You know, there's a big difference in that. That wasn't a slight on Donald Trump. That was a slight on the foolish attitude that that's true. In light of who we are as children of the living God who controls all things. He is our great and almighty God. Our Father, we learned this morning in the Apostles' Creed in uh, Sunday school. So, that wasn't in my notes. Already I'm losing control. All right. <clears throat> So, so I want you to know, though, that up front, it's important for us to realize that God's word needs to be the basis for our confidence and our hope. His pledges, his promises, his covenants, they all are meant to fuel our faithfulness. Because he is a covenant-keeping God, and he will never break his promises. And so this morning, I actually gave a, a little title to uh, this morning's message. I, I, I entitled it, The Reset. That's a simple title, and it doesn't capture everything about the chapter. But I titled it, The Reset. Noah admits, Noah admits to God that he and his family are sinners in need of grace and a substitute, and God accepts this offering as a sweet aroma. In verse 21 of chapter 8, Pastor Aaron covered that last week. By the way, although I wasn't here, I got to hear the message and, and enjoyed the journey of uh, Pastor Aaron preaching uh, and the good music, too. Uh, I love being able to tune in and watch. Uh, even though God knows the world will be populated by sinners again, he makes the promise never to destroy the earth again by flood and that everything will remain until the end, verse 22 of chapter 8, which again should give you and me great confidence. That God says, as long as I keep this world in, in place, there will be seasons. There will be harvest times. There are all these things of verse 22, uh, will, winter, day and night, all of that. You don't have to worry about it all falling apart tonight. God says, I put it in place. I will hold it. I got it. Stop fretting. There's plenty of work to do beyond fretting. No one is family or sinners. And you know what the truth is, dear ones? They're going to reproduce more sinners. By the time we get to chapter 11, you're going to see the earth is populated with them again. This will clearly be seen by then. So listen, I want you to understand something real quick, and then I'm going to start preaching. Where sin abounded, grace abounded more. I, I love that passage from the book of Romans. Where sin abounded, grace abounded more. So this is going to be a time... From here on in the book of Genesis throughout history, when God extends grace as his plan of redemption unfolds through the years, including our years. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, and I'm going to refer to that at the end of the message as well, uh, uh, Luke is writing and, and he says this, the time of our ignorance has passed. It's time for repentance. You see, the times of our foolishness, our lack of understanding, the time of God being so, so very patient in, in, the, in that moment was, was beginning to pass. And, Paul, and so, 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 so God is saying, repent. You know the truth now. You know how this is going to unfold. Now, let's get on into the message for today. I have just two points that I want to focus on. There will be some application peppered throughout the message and one major application at the end. Number one, all right, so just two points. Number one is this. God never surrenders his purpose for mankind. All right, I don't know if you've been reading the points to ponder this week that Pastor Aaron wrote. I wrote them for next week and he recorded them. So if you listen to the, uh, the, the, the app and the podcast, uh, you'll hear his pretty voice, not mine. 
Um, but this week, I've enjoyed those points to ponder deeply. Each one of them took one of the covenants listed in the Old Testament, beginning with the Adamic covenant all the way through the Davidic covenant. And so, so there's five days where you can read about the covenant that God established with humanity. And the, the last paragraph of two of each of those days was absolutely fantastic. So if you've not looked at the points to ponder for this week ending today, go backwards. The end of February, end of March, and you would do yourself a favor. It would be a great blessing if you would read those points to ponder that Pastor Aaron wrote in regard to the various covenants in the Old Testament. But what I want you to hear me say today in this particular covenant is that God never surrenders his purpose for mankind and thus the title for today, The Reset. So, so the fact that he never surrenders his purpose for mankind should encourage us. It should encourage us. You see, you say, what, what, what purpose was that? Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and pick up in verse 28, here's what we read. This is, this is uh, spoken to Adam and, and uh, by proxy to Eve as well. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And he says, I'm, I'm going to give you the plants to eat and all of that. That was a covenant of works, but it was, it was spoken to, to Adam and Eve at the very beginning. Go fill the earth with people who love me, who worship me, who will glorify me. We're, we're going to make a people uh, that, that I'll bless and we'll bless the nations. So he says, become a people for his glory. Be fruitful and multiply. He says, become a people who in obedience are blessed and who bless the nations for his glory. He said, become a people who stored his creation for our joy and for his glory. And then in Genesis chapter 9, we get to our chapter for today. And you hear the reset. Now listen, this is after the flood. The deluge has already taken place. Uh, humanity has destroyed, uh, with the exception of, of Noah and his family, and some of the creatures of the sea that would have survived, uh, and, and the animals that they put on the ark. So, so the flood has taken place. Judgment has fallen. Death like the world had never seen. And... Uh, before and and yet here we are no one his family have getting off the the ark they've made the sacrifice to god for atonement of their own sins they've worshiped they praised and we get to chapter nine and god speaks to noah and guess what he says the same thing he said to adam why because he will never ever surrender his purpose for humanity which is what? To glorify him. In a nutshell. To bring glory and honor to God. And as we do that, to experience the greatest joy for ourselves. Those two things are not in contrast. To live your life for the glory of God does nothing but fuel the joy that you will experience as you do so. Do you hear me say that? It's important that you understand that God is not a narcissistic uh, arrogant God who says glorify me I don't care about you no he says glorify me and as you do you'll have the very best life possible this side of heaven and beyond so there's no contrast between glorifying God and experiencing great joy those two things go hand in hand and to be honest with you one is not possible without the other so Genesis chapter 9 and verse 2 that Michelle read for us this morning it says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Don't you see the, the reset, the restating of the purpose that was first given to Adam and Eve is repeated here. Then you're going to see that in the, in the uh, uh, Abrahamic covenant with some, with some progression then you're going to see that in the Mosaic Covenant with some progression. And then you're going to see that in the Davidic Covenant with some progression. All pointing to ultimately Jesus Christ. I find great comfort 
great joy, great encouragement in knowing that God will never surrender his purpose for humanity. Never. He will see it through to the end, and that's good news for us. So in Genesis chapter 9, we see the reset. And all I mean by that is, is God saying, listen, we're starting again. I was reminded of, of, of that story in the book of Jonah, where God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. And speak to them about repentance and getting right. And, and of course, you know the story Jonah doesn't want to. So he goes to Joppa instead. Ends up in the belly of a great fish. Well, after three days in the fish, the old fish vomits him up on the shore with seaweed wrapped all around his head and digestion juices and, and all of that. And, and, and Jonah gets up off the sand. <laughs> and he says, now, what do you want me to do? He said the same thing that you were going to do before I put you in the, the belly of the big fish. My plan doesn't change. I am God. I don't make errors. I don't make mistakes. And so the same thing I need you to do then, I need you to do now. So in a very real sense like that, God says, okay, humanity, we destroyed most of it with a flood because of sin. But guess what? Now let's start again. Oh, what do you want us to do, God? The same thing we did on day one. Let's make a people who know me, who worship me, who are blessed by me and become a blessing to the world for my glory and for your good. And so Genesis 9 is the repeat and the reminder that God never surrenders his purpose for mankind. He says, be fruitful and multiply. You know what that is? Create more image bearers. You know, this past week, uh, and, and I've heard this many times, but down in Mississippi, one of the folks there one day said, I don't know why anybody would want to have kids and bring them up in this world. My guess is that many of you probably think the same thing. But I would say to you this morning, shame on you. Get over that. That's a, that's a view that is formed by secularism. It's a view formed by this idea that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and we've lost. Listen to me. God said be fruitful and multiply. Multiply how? Bring some more image bearers in here. And raise them up in the way they need to go so that they will bring glory and honor to me. And we can reach the nations. Rather than falling back, giving up, sticking your head in the sand, and just agreeing that we lose and giving it all to the devil. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I say keep having babies and let's get to it. And that's in keeping with God's commission for us. Be fruitful and multiply. Why are you scared? Do you think your God is no longer in control? Do you think that he can't watch over your offspring? Do you think that raising them up in the admonition of the Lord won't, won't work? Do you think the enemy's too great? That's not what my Bible says. Oh, that wasn't in my notes either, Miss Duke. Doggone it. <clears throat> Be fruitful and multiply. Create more image bearers. And then he says this in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. Rule over. And I want to add this. As stewards. The rest of creation. Have dominion. That's what he told Adam and Eve. He's repeating it in chapter 9 to Noah and his family. Rule over all of creation. As stewards. And, and, and within this text is worship God through faithfulness and obedience. So friends, we are to rule over the rest of creation as stewards. So you see so many similarities between this commission, this mandate given to Noah that we saw in the chapter 1 given to Adam and Eve. He's just resetting, he's repeating, he's saying, let's get back to it. But the world is not the same as it was when the mandate was given to Adam. All right, so stay with me now. We're going to see a few things in this text. It's not paradise this time. Now, Adam and Eve were created and placed in paradise. By the way, I think sometimes we wrongly uh, think of, of the Garden of Eden as heaven. I don't believe it was. 
I don't believe it was, you see, because I believe what would have been at the end of faithfulness and obedience would have been heaven. There would have been a consummation. There would have been obedience and worship and growing and becoming a people that God would say, yes, indeed, now you are my people. The consummation, the marriage supper of the Lamb, all that stuff takes place. But, but you see, none of that happened yet. We didn't reach that. And you, again, you, you see that same type of cycle. All of this stuff unfolds through God's uh, uh, a redemptive plan, but they never reach the fulfillment. They never come to be all that God designed us to be and has planned for us to someday be. And so, so this world that Noah and his family step into, the, the, the mandate is the same, but the, the world is not. It's not paradise this time. Death is very much a part of this recreated new creation. And I would say this, and I think this is what we'll see in the next few passages of this text. Many will be the threats to their mandate. Or did you hear me? Many will be the threats to the commission to become a people who obey and worship God for His glory, our joy, and the good of the world. Many will be the threats. For example, animals. Verses 2 and 3. I know this. I've been looking forward to this chapter just to be able to say... Verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I don't just have to eat lettuce and tofu and broccoli. I can have some beef, some chicken, some fish and some pork. Right there in verse 3. Hallelujah, praise God. You can kill them and eat them. As good stewards, as good stewards. But here's what I think the reason that's there. I don't think God just woke up one day and said, you know, I think it's time for meat. No, I think, I think more along this line possibly. God said, creation is not what it was at the beginning. Death and enmity exist between humanity and and the rest of creation, even amongst men. Man against man. Man against animals. Animals against man. Now all of a sudden, we live in a world that isn't so safe. We live in a world where the threat of, of beasts tearing you to shreds becomes real. And so God says, I've got to protect my progeny. I've got to protect my people. I've got to make sure that we get to the end. And part of that's going to be protect yourself. And in the meantime, go on and enjoy eating them too. Because you have dominion over them. You rule over them. But, but again, I think more important than whether or not we can eat meat, which obviously we can, more important than that though is the threat to the mandate. The threat to humanity. And God says, I'm going to allow for you to actually kill now that which will threaten. Which I believe leads into the next part of that passage. Where he talks about humanity killing themselves, killing one another. He talks about murder. Look at what it says in verse 4. And for your lifeblood I will require reckoning. From every beast I will require it and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever shed the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now, I want to I wanna add this in just quickly. Before you go home and strap on your sidearm and load your shotgun, which is all fine with me. I'm, I'm good with weapons. I don't have any trouble with it. We're not to just all of a sudden live wild west and decide, well, hey, God said I can start killing folks. They're a threat to me. I can kill. No, Romans chapter 13 handles that. Romans chapter 13 balances anybody's thought that says, hey, well, I can kill if, if people get out of hand. Chapter 13 of Romans puts hedges around that, boundaries around that, limits around that, and understanding around that. Make sense? But now why is that in here? He says you can kill animals that I believe will be a threat to the mandate. And then he goes on to say, and by the way, I'm okay with capital punishment. 
when a man has murdered another man, human beings, murdering one another. And, and by the way, witnesses and all of that in place. He says that man is to be killed himself by man under the stipulation of Romans chapter 13. Why? I think two things. One is we need to protect the family of God. We, he says, I'm going to see this, this through. We're going to fulfill the mandate to multiply and fill the earth. That has to happen. It's going to happen, but we got to protect ourselves. And so God puts in place these, these uh, rules, if you will, these regulations on protecting. And why, why would a man have to lose his life for killing another man? It's in the verse right here in verse 6. Because man has been created in the image of God. So, so two things I see. One is he's protecting the plan. Humanity. And two, because of the value, the inherent value and dignity of life. Because we as human beings were created in the very image of God. And he says, for that reason, no one has the right to take the life of one who I've given life to in my image. So there's value and dignity that we maintain as human beings because we were created in the image of our God. Now, you know this. Sin has marred that image just like sin has marred creation. So much of what we see in our world today, which I like that that article that Pastor Aaron chose for our, our um, resource for the week. What we think of so as normal in our society is so abnormal in light of God's original creation. And so, so friends, I want you to understand that sin has, has marred the image of God in us. However, the image remains and thus value. Marred, yes, but the image of God is still stamped on us, and thus we are men and women of value. And we should not run around taking one another's lives. And then third, remember what I said, it's the same commission, different world. Can you imagine Noah? Sometimes I just use my imagination. Could you imagine Noah living his life, doing what he does, Recognizing that sometimes he stumbles, sometimes his sons stumble. Recognizing sometimes that his daughter-in-laws don't do everything they ought to. And sometimes that his own wife gets out of hand. I can't imagine that. But sometimes that could happen. And one day it starts to rain. And Noah goes, oh heck. We better start building another boat. <laughs> it's raining. Does this mean that God is upset? Does this mean that judgment is falling? Does this mean we've, we've crossed the line of no return? So what does God say to him? Noah, I'm going to give you freedom to protect yourself from animals. We're going to put restrictions in to, to deter and to restrain Killing one another with capital punishment. That's what that should do, by the way. I'm putting these things in place to protect you. To protect humanity. To protect the, the, the commission. The purpose. And I'm going to give you another promise. And that is my promise to you. That you don't have to worry about me either. Animals not going to destroy you. Mankind won't destroy you. And more important than that, son, I won't either. See, you might be worried about that, but, but no, trust me. I will never do this again. You don't have to walk around every time it starts to drizzle scared. You don't have to worry about me dropping the hammer like I just dropped it. Because this is going to be a covenant of grace. And from this point on, everything's going to point to the coming of the one who will satisfy the requirements. So this is going to be a time of grace. 
And I'll never destroy the earth with a flood again. As a matter of fact, Noah, every time it starts to rain, I'm going to put this rainbow up there. Or maybe the rainbow was already there. I don't, we can't know for sure that he, because all, the, all of the dynamics of physics and prisms and wall, all that, surely that was already in place. God didn't come up with some new part of creation. I tend to believe the rainbow was already there. Now he just utilized it as a sign. And maybe they hadn't seen many rainbows, though, because it hadn't really rained. That just hit me as I was preaching. So, so the, the point being, everything that was already in place to create the rainbow was there. And so God says, listen, when it starts to rain and you get worried, here's my promise to you. You, you track it with me? You say, why, that would matter so much? See, in hindsight, it doesn't make a big deal to us. But he would have been terrified. How do I know you're not going to destroy us again? How do I know that everything I work on and build for and, and plan on isn't just going to be washed away? So God says, Noah, my boy, we're never going to do this again. I accepted your sacrifice at the end of chapter 8. It pleased me. And that's how we're going to finish this thing. Of the substitutionary sacrifice that's going to satisfy all of it. The, the passage I had Hucky read this morning I'm sorry, Mr. Huckey, uh, read this morning, uh, was all about that. I won't go there now, but I invite you to go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and read verses 1 to 7. That's what Huckey read for us this morning. So God himself promises that another flood is not coming. He promised man that he would sustain creation in spite of man's sins, which is grace. He promised to uphold rather to, dis to destroy, which is Hebrews 1.3. Christ upholds creation by the word of his power. The rainbow is meant to comfort man when he sees it. It serves to remind us of his promise and of our safety. God does not forget, by the way, because the passage says, as long, when I see this, I'll remember. No, God doesn't forget the promise of the covenant. No, that, that statement is for our benefit. That our faith would be strengthened. And, and so we must be constant in our faithfulness. Because God is. And he's going to see this thing through. I quote it from a wonderful theologian in my next statement. One of the best that I know. Pastor Aaron Bobo. In his, one of his devotions said this. From the covenant God made with Noah onward. The Bible is a story of redemption. Well said. Nobody on the planet could say it any better. The struggle for us is that both the Old Testament and our own lives. Show us that sinful man is. And he said this too. Incapable of of perfect obedience because of our wicked and rebellious hearts. So God's plan, and now, now stay with me. God says, I will never surrender my purpose for mankind. But now point number two. Mankind cannot accomplish this purpose by themselves. So God says, this is how I'm going to do it. Be fruitful and multiply. We're going to unfold it like this. But we are going to learn as we already have been, begun to time and time and time and time and time again that mankind can't do it. We keep rising and falling. We keep losing our weight. We keep sinning. We keep deserving judgment. Now I said this about point number one. God will never surrender his purpose for mankind. That should encourage us. Point number two, mankind cannot accomplish his purpose by themselves. This should redirect us. Now let me explain what I mean. The flood did not eradicate sin. You with me? Just because God killed all the bad people does not mean he eradicated sin. We see that before we get out of chapter 9. God's covenant of grace did not guarantee righteousness. Righteousness. 
Noah proves this in his drunkenness in verses 20 and 21. Let me go back to the text. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Now, that's a, that's a clean way of saying he just was three sheets in the wind and was buck naked. <laughs> he wasn't naked. He was naked. And I'm, I'm drunk, passed out. Embarrassing, as a matter of fact. This is Noah. This is the righteous one. This is the one that, that God made the covenant with and, 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 and the, the one and the beauty of that relationship. The obedience and the faithfulness that Noah had towards God and his love for him. And yet, you know what we find out, dear ones? He was just a man. Incapable of perfection and prone to sin. Just like all of us. Which leaves us in a pickle. Because Noah's certainly not going to be the perfect sacrifice. Noah's certainly not going to be the perfect one. Noah's not going to be the, the, the one that brings us like Adam couldn't into this place of, of consummation and perfection with our great God. You know, I want to say this in passing real quick about Noah. Moms and dads, listen to me. It matters how you live. I, this is just a freebie. Your actions affect your children. You know, I know they make their own decisions at some point in life too, but, but here's Noah, a righteous man, who ends up drunk as a skunk, passed out, bug naked, laying in his tent. And his boy sees him. Now, I don't blame Noah in that one incident for what happened to Ham. But surely, there's impact. And so I would, I would just remind you, again, I'm saying this in passing. I just want to remind you, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 7. It says, a, a man who walks in integrity, his children are blessed behind him. Love that verse. That's Proverbs 20, verse 7. Well, no one misfired on this one, as we all do sometimes. Again, we thank God for grace. So Noah, the, only thing, the thing I really want you to take from that moment, though, is that Noah proves to us that mankind in itself cannot get the job done. We cannot, apart from the answer, Fulfill the commission. We are sinners. We are broken. We have a penalty that needs to be paid. And there's only one that could do it. And it was not Noah. And, and I don't, we, we, we know where we're going. We, we see Ham, his son. Isn't that a crazy story? Ham goes by the tent, sees his daddy laying in there naked, passed out drunk. And makes fun. And mocks him. And criticizes him. And then tries to go get his brothers to come in and join in the mocking of their own daddy. You see, I, I want to just say this quickly about Ham. Because you may be tempted to say the punishment seemed too severe. That, that he was going to be cursed. And look, not just him, but the generations that followed him. His children. His grandchildren. It's, 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 a tough, it's a tough punishment. But, but I want to remind you that God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. And I guarantee you that the punishment fit the crime. Because God is just. And He is good. And He can never be less than that. So if anybody's tempted to say, well, you know what? This is over the top. God is unjust. You are wrong. You are out of step. And you don't understand the character and the attributes of our holy, perfect, righteous God. What he doled out through Noah to his own son was absolutely fitting 
for the heart condition of his son Ham. So what we see in this story is the, is the revealing of the condition of his son Ham's heart. He took pleasure in his own father's sin. He wanted to expose his, his sin further. He wanted to make a mockery of his own dad. That says a lot about the condition of that man's heart. And by the way, he was not a boy. He was probably a mere 100 years old. So we're not talking about a teenager who was acting silly. We're talking about a grown man with his heart condition being revealed through this sin towards his dad's sin. Shem and, and Japheth, on the other hand, as Shell read for us this morning, uh, Ham tries to involve them in his sin, but the boys don't bite, which I believe reveals something about their heart too. They realize what's going on. So what do they do? They get a blanket and, and, and kind of walk in backwards. Don't worry, I'm not going to fall off. With, with their heads, their eyes facing this way, and they go in the tent. They find their dad. They don't want to see him like that. They don't want to see their dad falling. They don't want to see their dad in sin. They, 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 it's not pleasing to them. It's not fun to them. It's not, it's not a joy to them. It hurts them to see their dad in that situation because they love him. So they don't want to expose his sin. They want to cover his sin. They, want to, they, they don't want to shame him. They, they, they want to close the door on the tent and not let anybody know that dad failed today. It says something about their heart too. And so they go in and they place the blanket over Noah who's passed out. And they walk out of the tent, close the tent, and have nothing to do with Ham's sin. That reveals a condition of their heart. Friends, do you rejoice in other people's sin? Do, do, you, do you try to involve people in your garbage? The world's full of people who do. Don't be one of them. Don't be a ham. You'd be a sham and a Japheth. Don't be a ham. Don't be turkey. Don't be slimy. Don't be any of that. You be like Shem and Japheth. Who rather than exposing people's sins in a situation like this, love covers a multitude of sin. And their love covered their dads in that way. So friends, Noah did not allow. Here's, here's another quick application, just kind of in passing. I don't want you to fail to see an important necessary application in parenting. And that's not the point of the message but, but, or the chapter, but I think, I think it's in there. Noah did not allow his love for his own son to rule over God's word. Can that sink in just for a second? You and I as parents, and I say it, dear friends, because it, I see it often. You must not... As a man or a woman of God, wink at your own children's sin and, and, and act like it's no big deal to you if it is a big deal to God. That does not mean, that does not mean there's not a place for grace and mercy and forgiveness. Absolutely, we need to, to, to balance extending that in our children's lives as well. But we must never fall into the oft-repeated mistake in parenting in the 21st century of just winking at your children's sin because they're your children. That's how you ruin them. When we make light of what God says is major, we are not loving them, we're doing them a disservice. And so I love the fact that Noah, can you imagine... Can you imagine when Noah woke up? Lord, I'm losing it. Can you imagine when Noah woke up and realized what had been done to him? By the way, some, some commentaries will say it was some kind of sexual perversion that Ham did to his own father and his nakedness. I don't buy that at all. I don't think that's what... It, when, when the Bible says he woke up and knew what his son did. It isn't like there was something on him or something done to him. I think he just, when he came to know, when, when he figured out what had taken place, Noah does not wink at his own son's sin because God didn't. 
I can only imagine how hard that was for this dad to look at his son and say what he had to say. Ham, you're going to be cursed. And your children will follow. Because of the condition of your heart. Not just because of what you did to me. It's not that. That's just a sign of the condition of the man's heart. And so judgment fell even on one who was spared in the flood. Because they weren't on the boat because they were sinless. So please don't wink and make light of what God makes major right is right and wrong is wrong and sin is sin and your relationship with your children even spouses doesn't change that for too many it does but listen to me church family you reap what you sow and when you eliminate that truth from relationships in your own house you do a person a grave injustice when you teach them that you don't reap what you sow galatians 6 7 you're setting them up to fail I'm not saying, by the way, never extend mercy and never extend grace and never be patient. Yes, we must. But you've got to balance that with this truth that they need to learn. There's a consequence for your decisions. You reap what you sow. Sometimes the punishment is severe. So, is God's plan doomed to fail because of man's sinfulness? Let's hurry up and finish. All right, they were my two points. Now we're going to wrap up. So, is God's plan doomed to fail because of man's sinfulness? Because what did we say? God is, is never going to surrender his purpose for humanity. He repeated it to Noah as he had to Adam. And you'll see it unfold throughout the scriptures. But number two was mankind can't accomplish the purpose. Because of our sin. We saw it all over chapter 9. We're going to see it all through chapter 11. It's all over the place. We can't do it. So is God's plan doomed to fail because of man's sinfulness? And I would say absolutely not. Adam couldn't do it though. Noah couldn't do it. Israel as a corporate nation couldn't do it. David couldn't do it. Solomon couldn't do it. So are we doomed? No. But listen, man's sin is going to have to be dealt with. And our hearts must be changed. That's, that's where this is going. You see, the, the, what we're trying to establish first is we can't do it. We're in a mess. We need a Savior. We, in, our, in our own strength, you're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to pull a Noah or a Ham or an Adam or an Eve. It's just who we are. So, so there's a problem. We can't do it. Which tells us this, God, listen, I hope you know this, God failing is not even an option. This not working isn't even on the table. I think I could do better for a priest like this. So, um, <laughs> all right, so listen, God not fulfilling his purpose is not on the table. It's not an option. He is not going to fail. So there must be another answer. And all of this stuff that Pastor Aaron and I are trying to do is pointing to that other answer. You see, don't sit here saying, gosh, it's not going to work. No, sit here saying, I can't wait to see how it's going to work. It's a big difference. I can't wait to see how God is going to pull this off. He's going to pull it off. He, he already has in a very real way. So, we know that our sin has to be dealt with. We saw that in Noah in chapter 8. We saw it in chapter 9. We know that our hearts must be changed. Thus, thus, brother Chris, a new covenant. A new covenant will be needed that will be, that will be listen, ratified with the blood of the only begotten Son of God. Does God have a plan to fulfill his purpose for mankind? Absolutely, yes. You know, when you read through the book of Genesis, you get to chapter 49, verses 9 and 10, and we see uh, uh, Jacob, Israel, as he's dying, and he's blessing his sons. And he says to Judah, the scepter will never depart from your family. And now let me trans translate that. A king's going to rise from the tribe of Judah, 
and his kingdom will be established forever. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 49. God is pointing to something, to someone. The king who will come through the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah, the lion of Judah, will accomplish what none of the rest of them or us could. 2 Samuel chapter 7 contains the Davidic covenant, which clearly points to Jesus too. Jeremiah chapter 31, Lord have mercy, I wish we had more time. Jeremiah chapter 31 is all about the new covenant, verses 31 to 33. You look over in Ezekiel chapter 36 and read verses 26 and 27, where we realize that what God is going to do in the new covenant is he's actually going to give us a new heart. As he regenerates us, as he brings us to life, as he quickens us, he gives us a new heart that is able to follow him, that is able to comprehend, that it becomes sensitive to the word and the ways of God. And he will accomplish in us and through us what we can't do apart from him. God still hates sin, and at that point, no solution had been found. There must be more to the story. And the more is Jesus. There's more to the story as it ends in chapter 9. And that more is Christ. Let me read from Isaiah um, chapter 54. Listen to verses 9 and 10. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, and I will not rebuke you. That's grace. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Hebrews 9.26 says Jesus died once for all. He did it. The blood of bulls and goats and rams and all that couldn't, couldn't take away sin. It just reminded the people of their sin. But one came who died and took away our sin forever. And he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. He set us free. And he did what no man can do. And so, dear, dear friends, listen, his word is sure, his plan is unfolding, so I would say to you, come to Jesus now. Um, Melody, y'all come on up, um, but as they do, pay attention to me, all right? They're just, they do this every week, all right? They look the same today as they did last week. Some of them are beautiful, some of them are ugly. That's just, it's just the way it goes. I'm kidding, y'all know that. Acts 17, 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world again in righteousness by a man whom, has, whom he has appointed. And so, friends, this is the day. This is the time. Come to Jesus now. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, There's no other name given amongst men under heaven by which a person can be saved. No other name than the name and the person of Jesus. But let me say this as we stand to sing. The Bible promises us something, a lot of things. But one of the things is Acts 14, 22, That says, Our path into heaven will be full of trials and tribulation." So don't think for a minute that when you come to Jesus that it's all just peaches and, and cream. It's still going to be a struggle. It's still going to be challenged. We still live in a fallen and broken world and we're still trapped for now in these fallen and broken bodies. But Jesus won the victory. And the Father gave us a new heart. And now we live. And I love a line from the chosen that we heard the other night. Even physical death cannot break my eternal life. The brokenness of this world does not change the goodness and the promises and the faithfulness of God who loves us and will see us through. Take him at his word. Trust him. Don't give up. Keep going. God's got this. There's more to the story and Pastor Aaron and I can't wait to unfold that for you.
as the weeks pass, Lord willing. God bless you, folks. Would you stand as we sing together?
be dismissed. Father, we're grateful for our time together. And we pray that you watch over us as we go. Help us to be found faithful. And Father, give us eyes to see you all around us. Hearts that are attentive to what you're doing. And Father, just a faith that believes and takes you at your word. May you be first and foremost as the no more priority of our lives. That we might know you deeply and fully in a life-changing, saving way. We are so grateful for your grace, your mercy, your patience. And we thank you, Father God, for filling us with your spirit that enables us to be pleasing to you. We love you and we thank you for this and so much more. In Jesus' name we pray.